Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Welcome to this reading list video. This is a special video devoted to uh, two related subjects. <clears throat> One of them is a person, but I consider him a subject in himself, and that is, of course, Keith Critchlow, and the subject with which he was involved his whole life is sacred geometry. So this is a reading list video devoted to Keith Critchlow and to sacred geometry. Um, I thought about making this shortly after the um, video on Sayyid Hussein Nasr was uploaded because Sayyid Hussein Nasr wrote an um, extremely interesting book uh, called um, uh, An Introduction to Islamic Cosmological Doctrines. That was one of the uh, early books of his which I encountered in my own studies and at the time I was pursuing a degree in uh, pure mathematics at Purdue University. And around the same time, I came across this marvelous book by Keith Critchlow, uh, which I later um, purchased, which is called Islamic Patterns, an Analytical and Cosmological Approach, with a foreword by none other than Sayyid Hussein Nasr. This is a splendid book. Um, so anyone who has ever encountered the beauty of Islamic architecture, whether directly by visiting countries such as Morocco or Iran or India or um, the south of Spain, what was Muslim Spain, uh, Arab Spain, Andalusia, uh, encounters a truly fascinating range of of geometric uh, designs and also floral designs um, based on geometric patterns. One also finds such things in um, Islamic manuscript illumination, uh, maybe in certain kinds of carpets as well, especially prayer carpets from, I suppose, Baluchistan. Um, there's also a kind of geometric pattern which you find in Turkmen rugs, but overall the subject of Islamic geometric patterns um, is one which until uh, Keith Critchlow devoted uh, a great deal of attention to it was I think relatively unknown and uninvestigated. So Keith Critchlow is an extremely important figure in um, sacred geometry in general, but in Islamic patterns and geometry in particular. Keith Critchlow, according to the Wikipedia entry on his life, was born on the 16th of March in 1933 and died on April 8th in 2020. He was 87 um, solar years old. Um, he was associated somewhat loosely with the traditionalist school with a capital T or the perennialist school with a capital P, but he was never actually, a, a, to my knowledge, a a follower of any of the uh, leadership figures uh, in that uh, group, such as Shuan or Nasser or, or Lings, although he certainly knew these people. He was also associated with various, um, um, various institutions that were concerned with sacred uh, geometry and architecture. One of these was the Temenos Academy, and um, the actual sort of catalyst for me making this video today is that I came across um, um, a rather old lecture of his on uh, YouTube where he um, spoke about different aspects of his work. And I thought, you know, this is a this is kind of a this is a good opportunity. It's kind of almost like a signal to me that I should maybe make a video devoted to uh, Keith Critchlow. So I can't recommend this book um, enough um, in, in terms of Islamic patterns. Um, so I would like to talk a little bit about this book and uh, why it is so important. Um, a lot of people really don't understand sacred mathematics. Uh, mathematics was a sacred science in the Islamic world and it was part of uh, the uh, original uh, liberal arts. It was part of the um, quadrivium. So there were traditionally seven liberal arts, the trivium being logic, grammar, and rhetoric, and the quadrivium 
is where mathematics entered into the picture, so to speak, and that would be arithmetic, geometry, um, the mathematics of music, or just simply music, uh, and uh, astronomy, astrology. Um, so it was, it was a basic subject uh, in the uh, Islamic world. And, you know, in, in Arabic, the term for mathematics is actually riyadiyat, or ar-riyadiyat, which means sort of uh, training. And if you actually look at the etymology of the word mathematics, or mathe mathematos, it simply means learning, uh, knowledge, in uh, ancient Greek. That's originally what it meant. And as I said, it included mathematos, included arithmos, arithmetic, geometria, geometry, um, astronomy, astrology, astrology, and music theory. And the mathematician, or the mathematikos, mathematikos was one fond of learning. Um, so arithmetic was concerned with discrete quantity or number itself in, in, the, in the sense of the Greek word arithmos. And geometry or geometria was the measure of the earth. So apparently this is its origin, um, supposedly going back to ancient Egypt, but who really knows? Um, now, um, so as I was saying, uh, arithmos or arithmetic was the study of discrete quantity and geometry is the study of continuous quantity, although it also did include some aspects of discrete quantity as related to proportion, proportionality, ratio and proportion. Um, so number and, uh, and, um, number and shape were considered to be profound symbols of a metaphysical character. Um, and if you look at the oldest and most important book on mathematics, uh, or sorry, on geometry, excuse me, and that of course is the, um, um, the Elements of Euclid. Let's get a copy of that. The Elements of Euclid, or Euclid's Elements. This is a very good edition. This is the Green Lion Press edition, which is used at St. John's College. Um, Thirteen books. This is extremely important. The more scholarly edition is in three volumes. You can buy it in Dover uh, Press. And this is the Sir Thomas L. Heath translation and commentary. Sir Thomas L. Heath. He was a great scholar of ancient Greek mathematics. I can put it this way. And I should say that the Green Line edition used at St. John's is very nice, uh, is uh, the translation of, of Thomas Heath as well. Sir Thomas Heath, it, it just takes out all of the footnotes and all of the deep discussion and so forth. But there's an extremely important commentary on Euclid's elements by someone known as Proclus or Proclus, who comes much, much later. Um, it is not complete, and I'm not a specialist in classical studies, so I, I don't know if um, if that's if he just left it incomplete or if uh, it only survives uh, to us in portions, whatever the case may be. I don't actually own a copy of that. I don't know if there's been a modern translation. It was originally translated by Thomas Taylor, a.k.a. Thomas Taylor the Platonist. He was extremely prolific um, in terms and, and, and devoted translator of um, ancient Greek knowledge. Uh, you can look into him. Uh, there's a website called the Prometheus Trust that sells it's something like you know, 20 volumes or so of everything he translated. He translated all of Proclus, all of Plato, all of Aristotle. Uh, but coming back to Proclus and his commentary on Euclid's elements, it's very much a philosophical commentary. Um, so these uh, things, in other words, um, discrete quantity and continuous quantity were considered to be profound metaphysical symbols. And in fact, I consider uh, Euclid's elements to be a kind of uh, preparation for uh, and culmination in terms of understanding the platonic solids, the five platonic solids, which are, of course, the tetrahedron, the octahedron, the cube, the icosahedron, and the dodecahedron. So the tetrahedron is four equilateral triangles joined together. And then the octahedron, you have um, 
a square base pyramid on top and on the bottom, so it gives you eight sides, eight plane faces, hence the term octahedron. The cube is well known. Um, the icosahedron is equilateral triangles all joined such that you have 20 sides, and the dodecahedron, which is my favorite shape, is 12 pentagons. I have a glass one here. 12 pentagons all joined together. It's interesting that somewhere in, I don't remember which dialogue of Plato, but Aristotle, sorry, Aristotle, Socrates tells Plato that the, the universe is actually a dodecahedron. Um, that is a subject in itself, but this is a fascinating, fascinating shape, and they all are. And I consider uh, the uh, book of Euclid to be a kind of preparation for the esoteric teaching uh, on the dodecahedron. Um, these... These teachings were extremely important in the Islamic world. So if you've heard of the Shifa of Ibn Sina, people study the last part, the Ilahiyat, or the metaphysics of the, uh, the healing or the cure, the Shifa of Ibn Sina. But it's actually a full-scale treatment. The, the larger book is a full-scale treatment of the full range of philosophy uh, as it reached the Islamic world. So here you see this is Kitab Shifa, and this is the portion. It says Jumlat, uh, Jumlat al Ulum al Riyali. Uh, so all of the mathematical sciences. That's my library stamp. And so if you come here, you will see after we pass to the intro, after we pass to the intro, you have. Just give me a moment, I will. You have here Al Maqalatul Ula. Uh, so the first discourse, and this is immediately geometry. And it jumps right in uh, to the definition of the point. So it's the same as in Euclid. And then here you see some diagrams. This is the famous Pons Asinorum, or the um, first proposition devoted to the. Uh, Vesica Pisces and the construction of the equilateral triangle. So, in short, you look, if you really want to learn sacred geometry, there's no way around it. You have to study uh, Euclid. Centuries later, we have Nasir al-Din Tusi, who has his own recension of the uh, Arabic translation of Euclid. Um, and what uh, Tusi used to do was that he would take all the extant translations of a particular book, such as the elements of Euclid. He did the same with the um, Almagest of um, Ptolemy. And then he would just take all the existing translations and rewrite it in good Arabic. This is a really beautiful uh, edition, a medieval edition, which was printed in Europe. And uh, so he's done a little bit better job in terms of organizing the material. And here he discusses um, some definitions and, and um, subject matter. So for example, he's he talks about how Every science has a particular subject matter and various characteristics, so what are called a lawar of the in Arabic. And then here he says that the mawdu'a, or, or the subject of this science, is al kamal muttasil wal munfasil min haythu, etc. So he says what I said earlier that the subject of geometry is dis, is continuous quantity as well as discrete quantity to the extent that. Um, or in the sense of discrete quantity being a ratio or a proportion. And this is a beautiful sort of addition, you see. And again, here we have the same diagram of the Vesica Pisces. Um, and if you don't know what the Vesica Pisces is, I really should maybe have demonstrated all this stuff, but I, you know, I don't have the, the resources to make such a video maybe. But basically, if you take a compass and set it to any... If you set it to any... Um, Radius. We've got a compass here. Really. The rotting set. Actually, this is what you need to do sacred geometry. You need to have a few tools. <laughs> so, you need to have a geometry set. So you need some compasses. You need a straight edge. You need a 45-45 triangle and a 30-60. Um, but in terms of the Vesica Pisces, so if you just take a compass, you open the thing up, you put it down. I don't want to jab myself in the fingers. So you make a circle, and then you go on the circumference of the circle you've just made and make another circle. 
you will get a kind of oval shape in the in the middle. And um, if you draw, if you connect the two centers of the circle with a line segment, and then you draw the intersections within there, you will get an equilateral triangle. So uh, that is an extremely important uh, construction. Um, right, so we've talked about the importance of uh, Euclid as a text for geometry. Um, and then if you're more interested in just sacred geometry as such, there are some other books, um, which I can mention. We have a whole bunch here. So this is the book Sacred Geometry, Philosophy and Practice by Robert Lawler. Um, and this is a book to read. It's very beautiful. It has a lot of nice illustrations. Like there's a picture of the Sri Yantra, which is a very important um, shape from the Vedic, uh, from the Hindu tradition. Um, a lot of geometry there. But the beauty of this book and the real importance is that it has sections called workbooks. And so for that, you need a straight edge or a ruler or a compass and so forth. And then you make all of these drawings and it leads you through a number of these so-called workbooks, various exercises, and then you get an understanding for um, sacred geometry. So this book by Robert Lawler is really excellent, but it may be a little bit kind of advanced if you've never uh, done these things. Unfortunately, now geometry is not really taught properly in any of the schools. I've met a lot of young people who do geometry in ninth or 10th grade. I live in the U.S., so that's usually when it's done. And if you ask them, have you taken geometry? And they'll say, yes, I have. We took it, you know, my freshman or sophomore year in, in high school. And then you ask them, how much did you draw? Did you draw at all? And they often say they didn't draw anything. And a lot of this is now done with computers, computer animation. That's not the way to do it. So there's a really beautiful book. I use this with homeschooling with my kids called Drawing Geometry by John Allen. But that's J-O-N, not J-O-H-N. John Allen. Um, this is a real, rel relatively inexpensive book. Um, I bought this in the UK, so I think it was about 12 pounds. Um, you know, as far as books goes, it's not really expensive. And so it has very step-by-step, um, -step, you know, how to do things like how to draw a pentagon from a hexagon, for example. It takes you through very basic constructions. And then if you do this, then you can go to the next book, which is Sacred Geometry. In terms of the platonic solids, John Allen also has another book called Making Geometry that shows you how to construct three-dimensional models of um, various three-dimensional shapes. It's it's a very well-done book. It's illustrated in color. You can see some an example here. And um, he has a website. He's a really helpful guy. I can say that when I was doing homeschooling with my kids, I, I emailed him. And he replied, um, he has some kind of a Gmail, and he was very nice and um, very helpful. So I would recommend these as, as really, really basic uh, for uh, sacred geometry. Now, I, I don't want to sort of say that it was only the ancient Greeks that did this, and, you know, I'm certainly not part of this whole... Um, whatever it's called now, this is this attacking Western civilization and this kind of, I'm not on this decolonial bandwagon. For, you know, historically, whatever we can see is that it was the ancient Greeks in the form of this text by Euclid that wrote this stuff down. But that doesn't mean that other civilizations did not have some understanding, obviously, of geometry. You just have to go and look at the pyramids. Um, and in this regard, you know, just in the, to be scholarly accurate and complete, there is an important book. This is this is the state of the art um, volume on this now. It's called Mathematics in Ancient Egypt by uh, Annette Imhaus, and this is published by Princeton University Press. So look, just so you know, no one can say I didn't I didn't mention. Um, this is an important book. Obviously, you can't neglect ancient India. Here is Mathematics in India again, Princeton University Press. This is by Kim Plofker. And uh, I don't actually have a book devoted to mathematics in ancient Babylon, um, ancient Mesopotamia. But all of these things are, are dealt with in some detail by the indefatigable Otto Neugebauer, 
I may recommend his book, The Exact Sciences in Antiquity. He actually produced three volumes, large volumes, on um, Babylonian um, astronomical tablets. So you have to understand that a lot of the, that astronomy, astrology is mathematics for the ancients. And obviously you can't do those things without basic mathematical calculations. Um, so, so there you have it. Um, in terms of ratio and proportion, there's a whole section in Euclid which is devoted to this. What is it, book five? Uh, we could check. I don't remember. Four, maybe? Check. Let's check. Ah, we'd have to turn to the actual thing and go through it. Never mind. Book five. I think it's book five. Um... So the most important ratio is the golden ratio, also known as the golden number. Um, so there are a number of books that deal with this. Um, it's also called the divine proportion. So in no particular order, we might as well begin with the book called The Divine Proportion, A Study in Mathematical Beauty by H.E. Huntley. This is a relatively inexpensive book because it's published by Dover. The Dover books are always relatively affordable. Um, another really nice book, a more modern book. Um, who published this? I thought this was Princeton, but I don't think it is. Well, we're not giving publishers, are we? Um, yeah, whatever the case. This is The Golden Ratio by Mario Livio. Yeah, we're just holding up the book, and you can look it up on Amazon find the publisher. A really excellent book with a lot of detailed information in it, but you really have to, you really can't read a math book without a paper and pencil. And if you're lousy at calculation, you need to have a, a, you know, a good scientific calculator like the HP 35S <laughs> or an excellent slide rule. Um, and it's, it's geometry, you need ruler and straight edge and compass. And so this is a beautiful book, another Dover. The Geometry of Art and Life. And finally, they translated a book. I'm told that this guy was a Romanian prince. Um, <clears throat> I like Gaika because he, he uh, it seems he also had read Genon. But he wrote a massive study of the golden number, or the golden ratio, uh, called The Golden Number, Pythagorean Rites and Rhythms in the Development of Western Civilization. Um, so this is um, this is inner traditions. Yeah, this this came out a few years ago. I actually think that the, his other book, The Geometry of Art and Life, is better. But this is this is not a bad book. Um, so what is this golden ratio? Well, uh, there's different ways of dividing lines, and so this comes out in in uh, Euclid in when you divide a line in what's called extreme and mean ratio. Um, and in modern mathematics, that simply comes down to the roots of the equation. Phi squared minus uh, phi uh, minus w uh, plus one minus one. Um, is that right? <laughs> uh, so it comes down to the square. Uh, it comes down to one plus or minus the square root of five divided by two. Um, and anyhow, that's extremely extremely important because that golden ratio comes up in the dodecahedron. <laughs> It comes up in the pentagon, the shape known as the pentagon, and it is found throughout uh, throughout nature. In uh, the construction of a rectangle called the golden rectangle, there's also the golden triangle. So on a pentagon, if you have a pentagon and you connect these, you'll have an isosceles triangle, and um, you will have... Um, 72, 72, and uh, uh, 72 degrees as the base angle, as both base angles. So that adds up to 144. And then to make 180, then the top angle would the, would be 36. And then you've got the bigger triangle here. So this would be 108. Uh, and then 108... So then you would have 36 and 36. These are all extremely important shapes in sacred geometry. Um, all right, so now we come back to, to 
um, Keith Critchlow. So this fundamental book on Islamic patterns, it also may interest you to know, has a whole section devoted to magic squares. I've talked about magic squares in some of my earliest videos on this channel, but these also have a relationship to Islamic patterns, and I thought this was a very interesting chapter. Um, when we talk, talked about the geometry of art and life, this book, you should keep in mind that geometry really is the basis, it is the metaphysical root of all manifestation. You really have to understand geometry if you want to understand anything else in the physical realm of manifestation. And uh, the, the point was considered to be a kind of symbol for the divine essence. And from the point, then you have a segment which radiates out, and then a circle is drawn. And that symbol, the circle, as well as in three dimensions, the sphere, is considered to be a very profound symbol for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for the divine essence, as it were. And, you know, how it says in the Qur'an, وَهُوَ مَعَكُمْ أَيْنَ مَا كُنْتُمْ And He is with you whithersoever you are. And that He encompasses all things. Well, how is this possible? If you think about the point, which is at the center of a circle, that point defines everything on the circumference. The point is, as it were, with every single point on the circumference, because without that center, there would be none of those points. Yet the center is not on the circumference, and the circumference is not in the center. Genon very much liked geometrical symbolism. He turns to it in many of his writings, most famously the symbolism of the cross. So when we talk about nature, one of the most profound studies of the reflection of geometry in nature is a study devoted entirely to flowers, if you can imagine, by Keith Critchlow called The Hidden Geometry of Flowers. This is a relatively expensive book. I haven't checked. Again, I bought this in the UK. It probably sells for 50 bucks or so in the US. I haven't checked, but it would probably be in that range. It's a heavy book. It's all very glossy paper. There are beautiful color photos and geometric diagrams. So if you can look at flowers, flowers represent, if you look at the actual leaves, um, various divisions of the circle. Here is an example, just taken at random. Look at this picture here, the color picture here, and then look at the, the geometric um, analysis, I may call it. Here in this diagram, my finger may be covering it. Um, so this is, this is a really a one-of-a-kind book. The Hidden Geometry of Flowers, Living Rhythms, Form, and Number. And I've, I've never seen any book like this. There have been other books like Matilda Geika's book on the geometry of art and life. There have been other texts like there was a famous book by a, by a, by a Cambridge mathematician and biologist named Darcy Thompson called uh, On Growth and Form. Um, I have a um, an abridged version of that book. I've never found the, the full text. I'm sorry I don't have it for this video. I cannot locate it at the moment. But this is um, a book also which I can't uh, recommend enough. And it, it, it goes far beyond any of, you know, a lot of these people who talk about design, design arguments for the existence of God. Um, well, this takes design to a whole other level. Uh, it's a very uh, profound um, study. This is also a knowledge which is extremely ancient. Again, I, I spoke about the ancient Greeks and I said, oh, there were other ancient civilizations that obviously had an understanding of a geometry. Of course, we would also include ancient China. We would include uh, even places that we don't know about anymore. You know, civilizations that have more or less died out. The ancient Maya. There's actually a very interesting book on non-Western uh, uh, understandings of mathematics, which I can't locate at the moment. It's called The Crest of the Peacock by a guy named Varghese. V-A-R-G-H-E-S-E. -E. But this knowledge goes way back to... to um, completely prehistoric times. So uh, you all may have heard of Stonehenge. Well, there's a beautiful book uh, that has Stonehenge on the cover by Chris, Chris so called Time Stands Still, New Light on Megalithic Science. Megalith and megalithic refers to giant stone structures such as Stonehenge. And 
he argues in this book that this knowledge of geometry is a very ancient one. And um, he, of course, he focuses on these megalithic monuments that we find uh, in England throughout the British Isles. And again, this is a book, again, on heavy, glossy paper, full of diagrams, photos, including in color. Um, this one's a bit harder to find now, but uh, I think you can still, it should still be in print. Um, excellent work. Uh, time stands still. And for those of you who are really interested in the whole mathematics of space filling, Critchlow wrote this massive design source book years and years ago. Um, I actually didn't do much with this, but I, I just wanted to have the book. Um, I just like fl flipping through and looking at the diagrams. It's called Order in Space, a design source book. You can look at the back. I'll just flip through here and show you some of the... Like here is a beautiful diagram here. If we flip through just at random, it's just full of so that's beautiful. And now there's also a lot of um, YouTube channels where people sit and draw, you know, so-called mandalas and other things like this in sacred geometry. Um, so you should, you know, do a search on YouTube and see um, what you uh, come across. There is a book which is a very profound one in the vein of Critchlow's work on flowers called Geometry in Nature. This is a more mathematical sort of book, but still visually stunning. Geometry in Nature, exploring the morphology of the natural world through projective geometry. Projective geometry is a little bit different from Euclidean geometry. Let's get a nice shot of this book. Again, uh, glossy paper, kind of heavy. These are all published by the by on the same. A lot of the books are published that I've shown you are published by the same publisher called Floris Books, F L O R I S, in the UK. So, in Euclidean geometry. The Pythagorean theorem is fundamental. That's um, whatever it is, Prop 48, I think it is, in Book 1. Uh, 47. 47 or 48. It's near the end of Book 1. It's the famous theorem of Pythagoras that says <clears throat> that given a right triangle, the sum of the squares of the sides is equal to the square of the hypotenuse. Um now, if you really think about that, that Pythagorean theorem is really a measure of distance. Um, so the Pythagorean theorem allows us to measure things. Um, and projective geometry is geometry without Prop 47, without, Pythag without, without a distance formula, let me put it this way. It's only points and lines. And it's 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 similar. It's um it's lies at the basis of the 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 system of drawing that emerged in in Europe in the Middle Ages in the Renaissance of perspective perspective drawing. Um. So. And you you may you may liken it as as those lines as sort of a kind of ray of light shooting out from uh, a center. So, for example, you can construct um, you can construct a parabola using only lines, straight lines. So here's what you do: take any ruler, take a straight edge and a pencil, draw a line segment, then draw another line segment intersecting that line, whether at an acute angle, an angle less than ninety, or ninety degrees, or an obtuse angle and I angle greater than 90 degrees. Then take a ruler, an actual ruler with markings, which you usually don't do in geometry, and, and let's say like every centimeter or some at some specific length, preset length, put a point on each side and put the same number of points on the other leg uh, with, with the same separation. Now start connecting them. Take the one of the dots and connect it to all the others and all the others. And when you're done, it'll trace out a parabola. So he uses projective geometry 
to show how many sort of structures which we find in nature can be generated using such methods, including, bizarrely enough, the vertebrae of animals um, can explain shadows, uh, rotations. It's a very interesting book, again, with a lot of, you know, color pictures and uh, lots of very nice diagrams. Let's, let's find one. Yeah. So there are um, textbooks on projective geometry. There's plenty of them, uh, but it's a little bit kind of involved. If you want to learn about it, the easiest way is just to get a Shams outline. Um, those are about the, the best kind of self-study math books that there are. I think I have one for projective geometry. Yeah, I do. This is a vintage vintage one. This is by Frank Ayers Jr. He wrote a lot of really good math textbooks. Yeah, Theory and Problems of Projective Geometry, right there. Um, so you can you can uh, look at that, but uh, that's if you're if you're really interested. If you've never really studied math, and you might find it to be uh, a bit of a challenge. Um, so just wrapping up here, there's two very accessible books. John Mitchell was an excellent writer on uh, topics related to sacred geometry, and I think this is the book he wrote that came out just as he just before he died. It may even came out after he died. I, I don't remember exactly when it was, but it wasn't that long ago. John Mitchell, How the World is Sacred Geometry, How the World is Made, The Story of Creation, or sorry, How the World is Made, The Story of Creation According to Sacred Geometry. Beautiful book. This is a, another, seems all this stuff is published in the UK. This is a, a London Thames and Hudson publishers. And uh, he has beautiful paintings throughout this book. I mean, look at that. Really stunning uh, artwork. There's a, my favorite, the dodecahedron again. Um, yeah. Beautiful patterns. And this is an extremely readable and accessible book. And uh, another one which is a bit more geared toward people who want to uh, draw is called Sacred Geometry for Artists, Dreamers, and Philosophers. Um, subtitle Secrets of Harmonic Creation by John Oscar Lieben. Uh, excellent work. Again, you know, you can't really do geometry without pictures. So these books are usually profusely illustrated. Here's just an example from this one. And publishing and the price of ink and paper and all that being what it is, typically then books of this kind are a little bit more on the expensive side. All right. So finally, for people who are really interested in stuff going in detail really deeply, there was a guy named Lawrence Edwards. Lawrence Edwards also wrote a book on projective geometry. Uh, but he wrote an extremely dense book on rotation. So you have to remember a circle is also kind of rotation, isn't it? And he called it the vortex of life. I'm just going to mention the name and you go and explore yourself. This is a very profound book, uh, which looks at the universal laws of rotation and periodicity and how they are involved in uh, nature. Um, he has a very interesting section in there about the human heart as a physical organ as well. Um, so all of this is related to twisting, to vortex and vortices. And the most profound book I've ever seen on this, this is also written at a very high level, is entitled Nature's Twist. And this is concerned with vortical motion, vortex motion in water. It's called Water and the Spirals of Life by Carl D. Moore. So in the books at the end, which I just mentioned, these are just little hints for people who really want to follow along. I can't explain everything to you in a video. That's why this is a reading list. Now you have to go and read. <laughs> um, but suffice it to say that there are profound secrets uh, in the world of ancient and classical mathematics in the beautiful patterns 
in, in geometry, Euclidean and projective, which are reflected in nature. And Allah tells us in the Quran that we should contemplate his signs in the world as well. And he says that he will show them. He says, Sanurihim ayatina fil afaqi wa fi anfusihim. And we shall show them our signs on the horizons and in themselves. Hatta yatabayyana lahum annahu al haqq until it becomes manifestly clear unto him that he is the truth. That is an excellent exhortation and encouragement to the study of sacred geometry, sacred pattern, and Beyond that quotation from the Qur'an, there is nothing more that can or should be said. Thank you for watching.